By the way, the poet I'm following is Basil Bunting, and the poet who's following me is Hugh McDermott. So what am I doing here? Anyway, what's the common denominator between me and them? I'll tell you. It's Queen Elizabeth Hall, which has now finally done its job in expressing democracy. This is supposed to be a poetry reading, but I don't even know if I'm a poet. I don't know what I am. But I must be something, otherwise how could I be here tonight in front of you? So let's leave it at that with the obscure solidity of my tall form being looked at by you and my mid-Atlantic monotones being heard by you, which completes the audience-performer relationship on a formal one-to-many basis. I suppose I'm supposed to read from something I wrote, but everything I wrote bores me. <laughs> Be because I wrote it in the past, and now it's now. What I wrote in the past doesn't fit in with the present situation. It seems dead and unvital compared to the living, throbbing moment of all of us here assembled in Queen Elizabeth Hall in, as it were, the Los Angeles part of Europe. <laughs> Most of us are the audience, a few of us are the performers. So yesterday I wrote an essay about this occasion to make what I say appropriate to this very situation that unites us all. And now, without further ado or fuss or fanfare, let me begin. If I don't soon begin, it'll be too late. Be because Charles Osborne, the Arts Council organizer of this event, has only allotted me 15 minutes, so I better hurry. So, so you keep along with me, and you hurry too. When I say hurry, I don't mean you should hurry out of this auditorium to leave me speaking here alone. That would be rude. I mean to hurry up while you're still sitting down. To keep your seats and still hurry means only one thing, that the hurrying you are doing is a mental hurry. And let me direct your mental hurry, but I better hurry. Consciousness is why we're all here tonight. When you hear these poets read, a more or less common bond of consciousness unites all us listeners with the poet who reads thanks to the good old link of unity called language. A primary thing about consciousness is it's going along in time, and words often keep it company or follow ideas as points of crystallization. So when one of these poets starts reading, we all start listening to him at the same rate of his reading to us. Not quite, since a word he's reading occurs slightly before that word is being heard by us due to the slowness it takes sound to travel. But we should accept that imperfection gracefully and not complain, simply because complaint couldn't alter such an iron-bound reality as the time gap between a word spoken and the same word being heard. So be a conservative and don't protest. Anyway, one of these poets starts reading, and we're hearing the beginning of what he's saying. He's giving us ideas through words, a flow of ideas through a flow of words, a progression of ideas through a progression of words. The continuity, the sequence, the building up occur to all of us in common with him, since the order of the words, the order of the ideas, is the same order for all of us who listen, in common with each other who listen, and in common with the poet who delivers that order. As with a symphony being played or an opera performed, the poem being read is made possible not through the auspices of the Arts Council of Great Britain, but through the auspices of time. Therefore, on behalf of all of us gathered here tonight, I wish to extend a formal thank you to time and its generous offices. Thank you, time. Keep it up. In fact, keep us up by not running us out of our lives too soon. Time keeps everything from happening all at once. It, it lets us put the left foot forward and then the right foot, <laughs> enabling us to walk due to a time gap between one foot forward and the next. 
Otherwise, it would be like our ankles were tied together in a potato sack. And, and we'd have to jump like a frog all the time, which is a natural way for the frog, but awkward for us. So anyway, one of these poets, let's say, is in the middle of reading one of his long poems. While we're listening to the words he's reading from the middle of his poem, we ourselves are reading in, as it were, to his reading of the middle, all that we, we remember in the series and order of ideas from the beginning of that same poem. Therefore, we're cooperating with the poet who's reading by extending him the courtesy of remembering what he's read of the poem so far. He ought to be grateful and pay us. Instead, we had to pay him because the tickets were so expensive to let us into Queen Elizabeth Hall in the Waterloo section of the British Empire. But it's too late to object because we already paid for our tickets so we might as well try to tolerate this deliberately arranged and organized evening of institutional poetry, institutionally read, even though that same poetry originated not institutionally, but privately in the private individual inspiration of each poet's solitary head. Finally, I'm about to finish up. Thanks for bearing with, with me so far. If we got as far as this, let's plug on and round it out with a suitable ending. I'm very dependent on your continuing to listen, more dependent than you are on my continuing to read. <laughs> so you see, you have the upper hand. Pardon me for addressing you collectively as an audience. I know each one of you is individual, but I don't have time to grant a private audience with each one of you in turn and keep on repeating my speeds over and over personally to you one at a time. That would long exceed my time limit here at Queen Elizabeth Hall in a politically weak country that used to be so politically strong. Therefore, regrettably, I resort to a manufacturing device. But instead of manufacturing a lot of identical goods via the same economical process as in mass production assembly line, which is a spatial thing involving spatial commodities, I speak simultaneously for all of you collectively at once, thus insulting you by reducing each one of your individualities to a herd figure. Actually, I'm the herd figure, for you hear me, therefore I'm herd. I'm glad I filled you in on the scene. Time is my theme. I hope time keeps pace with me in its timely fashion. I'm not so self-reliant or self-sufficient as to pretend to give this speech unassisted by time. I hope you forgive me for this weakness of relying on time. But where would this speech be without time? I mean, when would this speech be without time, not where? When is time's property, not where? That's why when someone fills my glass from a bottle of alcohol, they always say, Say when. <laughs> they, they don't say, say where. They can see my glass where. <laughs> if while they're pouring, I cleverly delay saying when, then my cup brimmeth over, <laughs> which is an antiquated expression of time-worn ecstasy. Time is one thing after another. How can I say that backwards? Easy. Time is one thing before another. But thing is arbitrary. The lumping together into substantive shape and form, notice the spatial terminology, of interpenetrating events that merge by transitive degrees in the flow of time succession. By the way, the previous paragraph contained no humor. Therefore, you did right not to laugh. You were right on cue. I hope you'll be equally expert in finding the right time to laugh. But I'll leave it up to you. No speaker should bully his audience, which so vastly outnumbers him here in Queen Elizabeth Hall, which is part of an island that's played a substantial role so far in the history of Western civilization. And I hope it never ends, especially not tonight. However, my speech is coming to an end. 
It's defied all the preconceived ideas of expectation and anticipation of what it was going to be. Soon, as soon as I stop, all it will be will be only a memory. But the memory of it will vary according to each person who remembers it, just like an article of furniture is different when you, when you put it into one room compared to the way it is when put into another room, especially if the other room is, is in a different house, like your house, for example. Also, what any one of you remembers about this speech will alter as time goes on. When I stop speaking, there will be an immediate afterglow that trails behind it like a wake behind a ship, swelling out behind it, dissolving into time. Then another reader will read, and you'll pay attention to him. All intervening events and experiences in your own lives between my speech and the next times you remember my speech will that much alter the memory of my speech. And my speech, meanwhile, will have its little lump intermingled with all you ever underwent since birth or maybe even before, who knows. Next week, in a wholly new context, you'll have your latest now. In that now, my speech will have gone through transformations of layers of memory, each new remembrance containing the sum of all previous remembrances plus itself. So you see, time distorts. Time distorts past events, but does not distort thought. Thought, as it's being thought in the now, is its own distortion. Therefore, it's direct. It's about time my speech has been. And it's about time that it should end. Therefore, as we're all in Queen Elizabeth Hall, where politics would never wish to stray, and where men tread, not angels, I must set this as our sight. We're all dying thanks to time, but time in its mercy delays our dying, retards our decay, to spin things out, to richly unfurl or feebly unfold our feelings and events, so that we have time for suffering, misery, joy, boredom, hope, desire, memory, anxiety, the majority banality, and the minority sublimity. By the way, you know what thought is? Absent matter. But thought sure does matter. Thought begins privately from the solitude of feeling. Then thought goes through the process of being socialized into rounded out verbal concepts. To socialize an idea is to eternalize it, like saying, that is a bad man when that man is only sometimes bad, and we only saw him once in the party circumstance two years ago, but we eternalize the bad impression he made on us as if he always was that way and he always still is that way, fixed and changing to that sole circumstantial bad. Thus, social communication has to blunt passing things into arrested eternities. We impale him to a myth or image. We don't let him change or be any different. We've taken his badness out of a time incident to make him an eternally bad man in our social conversation. By the way, since we're all here at the same time in Queen Elizabeth Hall, do you think that puts us all in one time? No, time is personal. So there are as many times in this hall at this exact moment as there are people in it. I think fashion, any fashion like clothing fashion, is awful. Fashion is the superficial of time. I hate whatever's trendy. However, here comes my blast as well against the opposite of trendiness, against that time-honored spiritual monument, eternity. I dedicate this speech to time. I wish time well. I hope it gets what it wants. But what does time want? Does time aspire to eternity? No. Eternity aspires to time. But eternity is too thick and hidebound, like an obsolete old vehicle of war, too cumbersome to be maneuvered. Too thick and hidebound is eternity to be able to attain its desired condition of time. Time is deft, quick, supple, like guerrilla warfare. Time is adaptable. 
Eternity is unwieldy, slow, crude, and gross. Time is eternity superior. Eternity will never reverse that status and usurp time. Therefore, eternity pouts like Iago and puts on airs, puts on airs of being absolute. But it's only being pretentious. Only time is real because only time is modest enough to be real. Eternity's immodest, presumptuous bombast makes it ridiculously unreal. That's why this speech will stop eternally, which only went on in time. Not only did, did this speech go on in time, it went on as well in Queen Elizabeth Hall. But where is Queen Elizabeth Hall? It's in time, just like us.